Welcome back to the story of liberty. This is John Bona. Someone asked me the question about heaven recently. We had a short discussion. I had explained to them that I almost was involved in a serious car accident, but God protected us and came out unscathed, not a scratch. So we thank the Lord for that. We started talking about heaven and people say interesting things when you talk about heaven. I wondered as we got into the conversation how big heaven really was. So I did some checking out in scripture and the Bible tells us that the city lieth foursquare. Revelation 21, 16. Now this means that the city measures 12,000 furlongs long, 12,000 furlongs wide, 12,000 furlongs high. Now furlong is not a term we use anymore except at a horse race, but it's an eighth of a mile of furlong. So you go to the horse track and I haven't been there for years, but I remember a six furlong race or an eight furlong race would be a mile. It's an eighth of a mile. So this city that scripture describes is 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high. Now, that's a big city. That would stretch all the way from Florida up to Canada and from New York over to Minnesota. That's one large city. Well, and think of it this way. A building that is 100 stories high, and if the stories are about 15 feet a story, well, that would make this city have about over 500,000 stories. That's how high it would be. We would need some pretty powerful elevators to get up 500,000 stories. It would have over 2 million square miles per story. Now that's the way the math works. The entire city would have over a trillion square feet of space. Now, one of the mathematical experts, he determined that there's, oh, I guess around 35 billion people that have ever lived on planet Earth. Now, assuming all of them went to heaven, and we know that's not true, but assuming all of them did go to heaven, that would almost be 200 square miles for each family in the holy city. Now, no one ever said that everyone is going to heaven. In fact, Jesus said just the opposite. He said, enter in the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there which go therein. He said that the gate is narrow that leads to life, and few find it. So, the conclusion is there's plenty enough space in heaven for everyone. Plenty of space. We know that in this heaven, the new Jerusalem, prepared by God, as a bride adorned for her husband, this city which God has prepared for his children is very, very different from any other city we have ever known or even dreamed of. 
Now we know the primary activity that goes on in all of our cities in this country is focused around sin. We're engaged in doing all kinds of bad stuff. Some of us try to clean it up, but it's very difficult. But in this city of God, there is no sin. In this city, there are no more street lights to lighten any dark and dangerous alley. There's no lamps, no candles of any sort. There's not even a sun or a moon because God himself shall be the light of it and the Lamb of God shall lighten it. You know, in this city of God, there's no hospitals, there's no doctors. Those things are all passed away because there is no more sickness. There's no cemetery. There's no funeral parlors. In fact, there'll be no more funerals. Now, some of you may not like this, but in that city, there's no taverns. There's no bars. But there's no slums either. There's no policemen. There's no Marines in uniform, as you hear. There's no police cars or jails or prisons. There's no courthouse because there's no judges or lawyers. Some of you like that. There is no longer any locks for doors. All these things are gone. There's no more sorrow or separation. There's no more tears, we're told in Scripture, because the former things have passed away. Heaven is a perfect place. It is a place that we can only imagine. You know, I've heard stories, and so have you, of people that have actually died and went to heaven. Some of them I'll talk to you about went to heaven and some went to hell. They have actually died clinical deaths in a hospital or somewhere else. One man explained he found himself in an experience where it was a swift passage through a tunnel of light and he came out and found himself flying over this beautiful city. He said it was magnificent beyond anything he could even dream of. He floated for a while until he came to this big, beautiful river. He followed this river and eventually came down upon one of the streets in the city. He saw several people walking there, mainly in white clothing. And he recognized some old friends and relatives. They were just walking very casually. And then this individual went over to speak with them. And before he could speak, he found himself in the hospital bed once more. He described the city as having beautiful buildings and streets made of gold. The Bible says that. The street of the city was pure gold. But it also says in Scripture that the city was pure gold. Like unto clear glass. Transparent glass. What a glorious city that will be. The buildings, the towers, the pinnacles, all made of gold, clear 
as transparent glass. I've always loved the thought of that material. It's the most beautiful material I can imagine. As a young boy, I thought about transparent gold. When I learned that heaven was made of that. And this water was clear as crystal. It was running through the town. It was not even what we can consider water, he said. It was so much better flowing out of the throne of God into a crystal sea. He said the flowers and the plants and the trees were there too. He said each blade of grass was a different hue and tint. Those of you who like gardening, you no doubt will have more to do than your heart can ever desire. So we know that the very place where God dwells, that God himself will wipe away all the tears from our eyes. Just think, there won't be any minister needed to do that, or priest, but it'll be the hand of God himself, the hand that has taken away sin. Because he took sin upon himself. You know, I love that scripture in 1 Corinthians 2.9. My good friend, Dr. Marshall Foster, who is on this program frequently, we were driving in South Carolina once and we noticed a billboard right off of I-95. And it was 1 Corinthians 2.9. It says, I had not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared. We realize reading that that was about heaven. What a glorious time that will be for the Christian. No forgetfulness, no anger. We know on this earth the scientific name for the curse is entropy. The second law of therodynamics which simply says that everything is wearing down. It's wearing out. It's decaying. It really becomes more disorganized. It grows old and perishes like us. But this curse will be lifted from the universe and with it all decay and death. That wonderful voice from heaven saying, there shall be no more death. Did you ever wonder what you will do in heaven? What occupation you might have in that Celestial city? Well, I don't know. But one of the things I want to do first is meet the triune God. I hope that I'm pure enough in heart that I could see God. Don't you want to see God? I'd like to walk down the street and talk to Adam, Moses, the Apostle Paul, Peter, Luke, John, King David. I'm looking forward to meeting them. I'm also looking forward to meeting the great people in history that we know about, about St. Augustine. I'd like to meet St. Patrick, John Knox, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, 
Perhaps we can walk down the street and talk to an archangel today. But most of all, think, there will be Christ the Lord himself, our Redeemer. Is that not incredible? That's who's in heaven, folks. There's a book called Beyond Death's Door. It was written by Dr. Maurice Rawlings. He's a cardiologist who is an expert in the diagnosis of cardiovascular diseases. And he's also a instructor for the American Heart Association and resuscitation techniques. He, for the most part, was a skeptic. He was basically a man who believed that when a person died, you were dead, you were done. There was nothing in the future, nothing to look forward to. It was the end. However, he told the story that he had a patient, a man who was about 50 years old, who had chest pains. He was put on a treadmill with an EKG connected to see if there were any problems with his heart. And the man started jogging on the treadmill and eventually something terrible happened. He dropped dead on the office floor. There were no other doctors in the room. So he called for the nurses and they began resuscitation. Well, they massaged his heart mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing. And after some time, the man came too, but he was screaming about hell. The doctor, Dr. Rawlings, was kind of shaken by that. I mean, he thought there was no such thing as hell. He didn't understand. He thought the man was just confused and delirious. Well, the doctor decided to work on the patient while he was there and help him but the patient kept losing consciousness rolling his eyes upward he stopped breathing and he would die once more each time he regained heartbeat and respiration the patient would scream i'm in hell he was terrified and pleading for help he had this terrified look on his face Worse than an expression seen in death, said the doctor. It was just horrific. His pupils were dilated. He was perspiring tremendously. And he was shaking. And he would say, don't you understand? I'm in hell. I'm in hell suffering. Each time you quit, I go back to hell. Don't let me go back to hell, please. At that point, the doctor became troubled. He realized the man was in a panic that he had never seen before in all his years as a doctor. And he began to work very hard to bring the patient back several times after several episodes with death. The man kept saying, as he finally came to, he said, how do I stay out of hell? Please help me, doctor. Pray for me. The doctor at that time was not a Christian. He said, I'm a doctor, not a preacher. Well, Fortunately, this patient was stabilized and he was taken to the hospital. And then the doctor went to visit him one day and he wanted to take notes about what this man had experienced. If there was really such a place as hell, 
He wanted to find out about it. So he asks, where are the flames? Where, where is the devil with his pitchfork? And the man looked up at him and said, what are you talking about? I don't recall any hell. He remembered nothing at all. See, this is not uncommon because Dr. Rawlings realized that the human psych had gone into operation and it does what it always does when confronted with pain and trauma, which is greater than it can tolerate. He suppressed the facts so they could not be remembered. Well, the good news is, folks, heaven is actually a place. It's not just a state of mind. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. It's actually a physical place. We know that Enoch, we're told he walked with God, and then he was not, for God took him. So, He never died. He just went to heaven in a physical body. He was then glorified, but it was still a real body of flesh and bones. Jesus himself said, Handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones, as you see me have. Elijah, he never tasted death. He was taken up in a chariot into heaven. And Jesus rose bodily from the grave, and he ascended into heaven. The angel said, Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Heaven is a glorious place. In scripture, it's described as a city on high, city of God, a city of light, the new Jerusalem. We know that heaven is also described as a paradise, an enclosed garden. It's described as a palace, Heaven will not be boring. I heard one person say that, oh, heaven will be boring. There's no beer up there. In heaven, there is no beer. That's why we drink it here. You've heard that. That's kind of silly, isn't it? No one could possibly be bored in heaven. We'll have all creation to explore. You know, and also in heaven, we'll recognize each other. We'll know each other in heaven. Did you know that? I think the Bible is quite clear that we will know each other in heaven. Will we know each other as we know each other now? No. We will know each other better. For now, we will see through the dark glass. See, then we will see face to face where there is no sin, no deceit, no anger at something said by a friend that we have a hard time forgetting, no grief, no remembrance of being hurt by a friend. And there's no guilt to separate us if we have hurt someone else. We shall know each other perfectly. There will not be any dark glass anymore. I've heard the discussion too, do people in heaven see us now? Well, in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. I know there are differences of opinions of what is actually being referred to here, but 
I think the reason to believe that those who are in heaven are the people who are being referred to, that we are being witnessed. I say that because I think there is evidence in Scripture that that is in fact the case. For example, remember when Saul brought up Samuel and with the help of the witch, Samuel was aware of the fact of what happened to Saul. The fact that the kingdom was going to be taken away from Saul and given to his enemy, David. See, Samuel was aware of all the things which had gone on since he died. Remember that when Saul brought up Samuel? That was not a good thing for Saul to do. And we know in heaven there is great rejoicing in the presence of angels of God when even one sinner repents. In the presence of the angels. Who is there in their presence? Well, they may be referring to the people that have gone on. You know, the Bible teaches us that we're never to pray for the dead. It does definitely teach us that they might be praying for us. Of course, they're not really dead at all. They're more alive than you and I will ever be on this earth. I've heard it said by the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, he said to the something to the effect, he said, when I die, don't mourn for me because I won't be dead. I will be more alive than I had ever been in my life on earth. You may have heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Americans pronounce his name Bonhoeffer, but he was a great man, a great theologian, a great preacher who stood up to Adolf Hitler and actually was the man who probably did more to bring down Hitler than anybody else. History has now recorded that. And Hitler even knew it himself. You know, here's what the great Bonifer said in his last sermon that he preached while a pastor in London. He said, No one has yet believed in God and the kingdom of God. No one has yet heard about the realm of the resurrected and not been homesick from that hour, waiting, looking forward joyfully to being released from bodily existence. Whether we are young or old makes no difference. What are 20, 30, or 50 years in the sight of God? And which of us knows how near he or she may already be to the goal. Why are we so afraid when we think about death? Death is only dreadful for those who live in dread and fear of it. Death is not wild or terrible, it, only if we can be still and hold fast to God's word. Death is not bitter if we have not become bitter ourselves. Death is grace. The greatest gift of grace that God gives to people who believe in him. Death is mild. Death is sweet and gentle. It beckons to us with heavenly power. If we only realize that it is the gateway to our homeland, the tabernacle of joy, the everlasting kingdom of peace. How do we know that dying is so dreadful? Who knows whether in our human fear and anguish we are only shivering and shuddering at the most glorious, heavenly, blessed event in the world. Death is hell and night and cold if it is not transformed by our faith. But that is just what is so marvelous that we can transform death.
That was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a man who at a relatively young age was hung by the Gestapo and killed. Just three weeks before the Allied forces invaded Germany and it was the end of the World War II. But the big question for all of us folks is will you be there? That is by far the most practical question, isn't it? By the way, all those near-death experiences, those that had attempted suicide and did not die, did not have a good experience. So any of you thinking about getting to heaven sooner, don't think you could go that way. Wait for God's timing, not yours. That is the final question. When the roll is called up yonder, will you be there? You know, there are millions and millions, probably billions of people in this world who don't know that. You could go through this world without an education, without a car, without even a home or a place to live. But those things aren't really that important. But the one thing we cannot go through this world without having, having to know is eternal life. Because if we miss that, we miss everything. And we miss it forever. So that is the question. That is the great question question of the story of liberty because liberty comes from Christ that's what this program is all about ultimately and some of you may know or may not know how to get there see there's only one bridge from earth to heaven and it's shaped like a cross Christ the Lord paid that price when they crucified him at Golgotha. He took our sin, our guilt upon him. When he endured the wrath of his father, he took our place. He paid for all our sins. And he offers eternal life to all those who repent of their sins and trust in him. That is the story of liberty. It's not hard to invite him into your heart, to make him Lord of your life. See, if Christ is not king in your heart, if he does not dwell as king in our hearts, you will not dwell in his mansions above. Don't be deceived. There's so many deceptions. Few there will be that enter in. Few there will be that find it. Matthew 7, 13, and 14. But folks, there is a way. There is a way, and it's the way of grace. To all of us who will acknowledge our sin, our guilt, and put their trust in Christ the Lord. Christ is waiting to receive you. But the question is, will you come to him? Come to God. Be a joint heir with Christ to an inheritance incorruptible. It never fades away, reserved in heaven for you. God bless you, and thank you for joining us. A 
on the story of the